Sis, it sounded like they had more faith this morning. Incredible. It's good to be with the Dublin International Christian Church. I want to once again lift up Victor for coming and being with us this weekend. It is incredible to have Victor come and be a true disciple. I want to thank Taffy for preaching a word in her communion today. No, that's awesome. You know the sisters are supposed to come up and share their convictions. Taff, I, I was convicted. Taff preached the word. She really got into the scripture. She really helped us to understand that we need to hold on. We need to hold on. You may have had a reason this week that you felt like you couldn't hold on. You know, when the, when the Lord has got you on that carousel, that roundabout of rebellion, that's spinning a little bit too quick, and you're gripping onto that thing, whoa, you just got to hold on in that moment. You have just got to hold on. I thought Sean O'Farrell did a great job with the contribution. You know, Sean's got a shiny new Bible from his awesome shiny new girlfriend. And, and I don't know, there just was more faith coming from, you know, the, that, that Bible right there. And then that, um, maybe I need to get myself a new Bible. Maybe, maybe that's the trick because, you know, my pages are falling out and all kind of stuff. So my birthday is coming in, in next week. If you guys want to buy me a Bible, just, just, uh, you know, just saying. So the, the, Lord, the Lord put a sermon on my heart. The Lord put a sermon on my heart earlier on this week. I had an incredible quiet time. And I said, this has got, this has got to be the sermon. And I was reading and, and had, I was sitting on the bus and I had Maureen come over my shoulder and said, what are you reading, bro? I said, a commentary, bro. This thing is fire. And he said, oh, what is it? I said, don't worry, bro. Don't worry. I'm, 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 I'm sifting for gold here. I'm getting my nuggets out. And then, you know, I don't know if he carried on reading over my shoulder, but I, I think he uh, listened to him. But the Lord put something on my heart. But then as the week progressed, I was like, mm, should I preach it? Should I preach it? Should I not preach it? Should I preach it? I don't know. God, make, make it clear. And you know, as I do on my Friday mornings, I, I go up my, my metaphorical mountain. And my mountain is actually quite horizontal. I, I, walk, I walk the pier in Dunleary, and I go to the edge there to, to be one with nature, to see the waves, and I, and I go and write my sermon outside, rain or shine. I want to spend that time out there with God and be inspired by what I see. And so I went to one of my usual prayer spots on Friday morning. And I'm having a great time talking to the Lord about what he wants me to preach. And I speak about every single one of you. Say, God, give me insight into Callum's life. Give me insight into Victor's life. He's coming. I want to be able to preach into his heart. Give me insight about Neche. Give me insight about Anna. And I pray for all of you by name because I believe that if I'm going to preach to you, I've got to pray for you. And I think about the church that I'm speaking to. And, and so I go, what is, oh, what is that smell? And I start looking around, I was like, did I step in something? And I'm like looking at my shoe, there's nothing on the bottom of my shoe. And I look, I look around me and, and there's, there's nothing going on. I see a rat, scurry, a sea rat, I suppose. I don't know if that's such a thing, but it's, it's a, sea, a sea rat. It's a sea rat. And, and so the sea rat scurries in front of me and I go, oh, interesting. And then, and then, and then the smell keeps on, it's progressing, you know, like we should do as Christians. The smell was doing that. It was adding to its faith, goodness, and knowledge, and perseverance, you know. That, that, that was, a, it, uh, the smell was growing, and then I saw another sea rat scurrying this way. And so this time I decided to follow the sea rat with my eyes to see where the sea rat was dwelling. And the sea rat dived face first into a dead dolphin. Really, it was a porpoise, but you guys don't know what that is. So it's kind of like a small dolphin. And so I was like, what is that? I thought it was maybe a, a seal that had been washed up. And as I, as I climb over the rocks like Sean O'Farrell would do, but I kept my shoes on, I, 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 I walked across these rocks and I saw this, this, this where the smell was coming from. And it was a dead porpoise. And the rats were going to town on this dead porpoise. But it was so smelly. And so naturally, as I'm writing my sermon, I looked up to the sky and I said, Lord... What is the purpose for the porpoise? <laughs> what is the purpose for this porpoise? I was like, I don't, I don't want to be that guy. That, that's, that's what I know. So I said, I'm going to go to a new press spot. And so I climb back up the stairs and I carry on walking down the pier at Dunleary. And as I peer over the pier and I see the ocean, guess what I see next? An alive porpoise. Wow. Swimming and, and, and going like, like flipping over the top of the water. I was like, wow, that's amazing. I like that one much better. Yeah. That, that, look, that's the kind of porpoise that I want to see. And I said, Lord, what is the purpose for the porpoise? And then I carry on walking down. I see another one leaping. 
And I saw about maybe three, four, maybe it was the same one three or four different times, but I saw a lot of porpoises that day. And so I was asking the Lord, what is the purpose for this porpoise? Until it hit me. Luke, you've got to preach the message that God put on your heart a few days ago. Because you saw what a dead, stinking, rotting porpoise looked like. And then you saw the life of a porpoise that was doing its thing. Having a great time. Refreshed. Full of joy in its natural habitat. And so the title, naturally, for today's sermon is Repent or Perish. Mm. Repent or Perish. It was very clear to me that the Lord was speaking through that porpoise. The purpose of the porpoise was to show me what something dead and perishing looked like. And the refreshment of repentance in this leaping porpoise. As I was on my prayer walk, God said, no, Luke, don't worry. You've got to preach that sermon. You're going to make it clear to the church what it means to repent. That's the purpose of the porpoise. Turn to Luke chapter 13. You know, we're still in the book of Mark because we want to make our mark as a church. I'm sure many of you have already finished uh, studying the book of Mark for your quiet times. It's not that very long. It's actually the, the shortest gospel in only 16 chapters. But he seems to cover the same amount of stuff that Matthew does in 28. Mark's gospel is just a, a, a shockwave. It's kind of like the, the, the waves on the shore at Dunleary just bow, bow, bow. And so it's taken me a while to get through. It's taken me a while to get through. Don't worry, we're going to get through it eventually. We may pick up a little pace there. But as a running start, I want to show you Luke chapter 13. It says in verse 5, say amen when you're there. I tell you no, unless you repent, you too will all perish. I mean, this isn't just a smart title that I got from my head. This is in the Holy Bible. Jesus says there are two options. You may have an NIV Bible. It may even be the subheading for this portion of scripture. Repent or perish. Those, those, that's challenging odds. Repent or perish. You only have two options to choose from according to the Bible here. You've got to repent or you've got to perish. It says in verse 6, Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he went to look for fruit on it but did not find any. Now what kind of fruit would you expect from a fig tree? Right. And so if you had planted this fig tree Now you've got to know something about fig trees, especially in Israel, the custom was to wait for periods of growth in this fig tree. Once you had first planted the fig tree, you had to wait for about three years for it to mature enough to produce edible figs. According to the the Hebrew custom, you then couldn't pick it for a further three years. And in that time, the fruit was allowed to mature and also other people were allowed to eat the fruit first. You were allowed, it was the same thing with the crops, that the Israelites were told, don't pick everything that is in your crops. Because you want foreigners and people who are homeless to be able to go and get a bit of benevolence from your crops. And so it was the same for the fig trees. So if this man is going to look for fruit on this fig tree, he's waited six years. That's a lot of patience. He's hungry. I mean, if you're waiting six years for a fig, you just want to slice that in half. Maybe some feta cheese, drizzle of honey, maybe some pumpkin seeds, you know. We got got Tammy, she's she's a chef right there. Tammy's trying to start a a chef business. So she's going, okay, Luke, you you got your little thing. You you put that honey on and and that's that. You you want a bite of that fig. You want a bite of that fig. But he did not find any. You would feel pretty, pretty irritated at this fig tree. I've waited six years. Six years for this fig. And there's no fruit. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? In this parable, God is the owner of this fig tree. But the man who took care of the vineyard is Jesus. And God says to Jesus, this disciple is not bearing fruit. There is no fruit in this. I've been coming to see. I've been spending three years seeing if this disciple will change. And not blame his surrounding, not blame the church, not blame the disciple. But is that disciple. Notice that he doesn't go to the, to the owner and say, why hasn't this fig tree grown? Because it's not the one that's taking care of the vineyard. It's the fig tree. Fig tree's got an issue. 
I haven't found any. Why should it use up the soil? And so Jesus says, sir, leave it alone for one more year. I'll dig around it. I'll fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, awesome. If not, then cut it down. Jesus is with God here. He says, hey, yeah, you're right. If this fig tree continues to be an unfruitful fig tree, you've got to cut that thing down. If it doesn't repent, it's going to perish. But you see the grace of Jesus here. The grace that should lead this fig tree to repentance. Say, leave it alone for one more year. Give grace. Be patient with this fig tree. I'm going to dig around and fertilize it. Now you guys know what fertilizer is, right? Mostly it's done. So if you feel like your life is getting a bit dungy, that you're feeling a little bit dug out, that Jesus is scooping up some nice fresh fertilizer on you, he's just trying to get you to produce fruit. Maybe God sees that you as a disciple have not been a very fruitful fig tree. And so he's trying to dig stuff out of your heart. Put fertilizer on you so that it character grows. Romans chapter 5 talks about perseverance producing character that can only come through suffering. And so God is allowing that suffering, that fertilizer, to really get you to be a productive fig tree. That's the grace of God. He's calling you to repent, not perish. Now, a few years ago, I went sharing my faith down uh, Wembley. It's where they do all the football in London. I'm walking up and down this strip and I, w- I just want to be fruitful. And so me and Abhishek, who is a brother now in New Delhi, we're, we're walking around up and down. We're sharing our faith and we're about to go to Campus Devo. I said, Abhishek, no, one more. There's one more guy. I, God has told me to turn around, share your faith with one more guy. So we turn around and this was kind of coming out of COVID. And there was this dude dressed fully in black with a mask here and his hoodie here. And so I could just see his eyes. And I said, do you want to study the Bible? He said, yeah. (laughs) I was just this Chinese looking face kind of popped out at me. I was like, okay, awesome. He's like, when? I said, well, we have a discussion tonight. He says, I'll be there. Where? About an hour away. I'll be there. What are you going to talk about? This scripture. Okay, I'll be there. And so this man came and he sat on my sofa as I I preached this scripture for Bible talk. And he put his hand up at the end. He said, so are you saying that the grace of God, like, will run out that if it's not once saved always saved that if if i if if i don't i mean if people don't change then they'll perish I said absolutely that's what the scripture teaches mm-hmm. i've never heard anyone teach that i said well do you see it from the bible I said yeah i totally see it from the bible and so we met the next day and then we met the next day after that and then we met the next day after that and then we met the next day after that and on that sunday gareth got baptized <laughs> Gareth got baptized. That was an awesome moment. Gareth was hilarious to study the Bible with. I did the discipleship study with him, and he was convicted the whole way through. And I said, so Gareth, do you understand the scriptures? He said, yeah. I said, so are you a disciple? He said, yeah. Only joking, I'm definitely not a disciple. I said, you little rascal. And he's been like that the entire time, and now Gareth is a missionary in China. That is an awesome story. But Gareth understood, wow. I think I'm, I'm playing with God here. God is trying to dig around me. He's trying to fertilize me. But I'm resisting this growth process. God is, Jesus is giving me opportunities to grow, but I'm resisting it. And I don't know how long that year. The Bible says to the Lord, a year is like a a thousand years. A day is like a thousand years. And so when Jesus gives us another year, maybe that's a few. Maybe it's less. We just need to trust that God is trying to make us a fruitful fig. Tree. Let's go to the book of Mark. Have a look at Mark chapter 6. I'm fired up to have Victor in town with us. You know, Victor was fruitful whilst on the plane. Victor shared his faith. He was texting me before he came to Dublin and he said, Bro, we just finished a cross study. Da, 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 da. And as Victor is flying on his way to Dublin, the person that he met got baptized in Lagos, Nigeria. That's, that's, an, awesome, that's an awesome brother right there. Mark chapter 6 says in verse 7, calling the 12 to him, he sent them out two by two and he gave them authority over evil spirits. These were his instructions. 
Take nothing for the journey, except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Jesus wanted them to be completely dependent upon God. The only thing that they needed was the staff, which symbolized leadership. So you guys are going to need some leadership here. You don't need money. You don't need that kind of stuff. Use that leadership. Grow in your leadership so that you can get your needs met by God. Wear sandals. Come on, Sean. But not an extra tunic. Come on, Sean. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave as a testimony against them. They need to know that they have rejected the word of God. And so what was the message that Jesus called them to preach? Look at verse 12. It says they went out and preached that people should repent. That's a good message. This was Jesus' ministry. Point number one, repentance is a New Testament reality. Repentance is a New Testament reality. Oh, yay, man. Well, Jesus told this. This was, this was technically still Old Testament. John the Baptist was technically an Old Testament prophet because the new covenant didn't come until after Jesus died on the cross. And so all of this is, is still technically Old Covenant. Still technically Old Testament. It's only until Luke chapter 24, Matthew chapter 28, Mark chapter 16 that the new covenant actually begins. The book of Acts through to the end is under the new covenant. But, but they, they were preaching repentance, right? So, so okay, m- maybe repentance is an Old Testament thing. That's all you see the Old Testament prophets preaching. Jonah said, hey, go to Nineveh, tell them to repent. He said, I don't want to go to Nineveh. I don't want them to repent. Sometimes that's how we feel. It's like, man, these guys don't deserve repentance. That's how, that's how Jonah felt about the Ninevites. But at the end of the day, he went and he preached the shortest sermon of all time. I believe in the Hebrew, you look into it, he's only about six words that Jonah says to the Ninevites. And it says, they immediately got into sackcloth and ashes and repented before the Lord. He preached, you guys better change. And they said, you are totally right about that. And so they changed. You look at Isaiah's story. He was preaching for the kingdom of Israel to repent of their idolatry. He, you look at David's story. You look at all of these prophets in the Old Testament. They're constantly preaching the message of repentance. And so we see this Old Covenant message still in act when Jesus sent his apostles to all these places. So maybe repentance is an Old Testament thing. Let's look at Luke chapter 24. Let's see what Jesus told them to preach after his resurrection. You know that awesome resurrection that means you can live a new life? That awesome resurrection where Jesus was, was pierced by a spear, all the water poured out, his hands were laid on the cross so that all your sins could be forgiven. You, re- you remember that one? The one that produced grace, the one that the temple was torn, the curtain in the temple was torn so that the presence of God could go out into all humanity. You remember that one? You remember the one that the Holy Spirit was able to come down in Acts chapter 2 and now the Jews and in Acts chapter 10, the Gentiles could enter the kingdom? That, that, that resurrection, yeah. that powerful one. After his resurrection, Jesus says in verse 44, he said to them, this is what I told you. Uh, Jesus said that, I told you so a moment. I told you so. While I was still with you, everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. That's incredible, first of all. Jesus says, I am the fulfillment of the Old Testament. That's the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. That makes up the whole Old Testament. He says, I have fulfilled it. You ask, okay, so why don't we do the the Sabbath rest on a Saturday? Jesus fulfilled it. So why aren't we afraid of eating lobsters? Because Jesus fulfilled it. Why do we get to eat bacon on a Saturday morning? Jesus fulfilled it. Why don't we all have to wear matching clothes and all that kind of stuff and have the curly whirlies and all that kind of stuff? Jesus, Jesus fulfilled it all. And so... Paul actually disciples one of the churches in, in the New Testament. He says, hey, if, if you want to follow some of the law, you've got to follow the whole law. And there were men that were telling, yeah, you can be Christians, but you still need to be circumcised. Paul said, I wish you would go the whole way and emasculate yourselves. That was Paul the apostle. And yet we have churches today that want to follow parts of the law, but forget that they need to follow the, for the whole law. That is not, Jesus fulfilled the law. 
Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament. It says, then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures, referencing the Old Testament. See, the whole Bible is about Jesus. The Old Testament is about the coming of Jesus. The Gospels is the life of Jesus. And Acts through to Revelation is the impact of Jesus. The whole Bible is about Jesus. And he's got to understand, open our minds so we can understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So the message after Jesus died on the cross, after his blood was shed for the forgiveness of your sins, was still repentance. Jesus still continued to preach repentance after his death, burial, and resurrection. The very first time we see Peter preach the gospel message, look at Acts chapter 2. I knew you guys would be quiet on this one today, but I didn't think you'd be dead. He is looking like a smelly porpoise at the moment. What's the purpose? I want you guys to, by the end of the sermon, I want you to be leaping over the waters in Dunleary. It's okay. Don't worry. We're going to talk about grace in a bit. Relax. Don't worry. Verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. You say, who is he speaking to? Well, if you look earlier on in the chapter, he's speaking to Jews from every nation under heaven. Pamphylia, Phrygia, Cyprus, Arabia. But he says, you crucified Jesus. We know that it was a Roman centurion that was there putting the nails into his arms. We know that it was Pontius Pilate and Herod that ultimately put the scheme together to put Jesus to the cross. But he said, you guys, you guys that have never seen Jesus in your life, you put Jesus to the cross. Helping us to understand that we, we all have personal responsibility for putting Jesus to the cross. And now God has made him both Lord and Christ. He's the sovereign, he's the savior. He's the sovereign and he's the savior. He can't be your Lord and not your Messiah. He can't be your Messiah and not your Lord. You cannot be saved by Jesus if you're not willing to come under his sovereignty and obey his will. It says when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles brothers what shall we feel no. you know because this is an emotional thing man what, what, what should we feel about this moment no brothers what shall we think no. you know you're gonna give me some intellectual stuff right here I'm European so you gotta tell me what to tell, tell me what to think over here let's give me a degree on the cross of Jesus and then maybe I'll become a Christian no it doesn't say that it says brothers what shall we do they understood that this required action. The gospel required action. You can't spell gospel without go. They understood that the gospel required action. Peter replied. After they said, what shall we do? Hear the gospel message. What shall we do? What did Peter say you need to do? Repent. Repent. Was this after Jesus died for their sins? Yep. Did that negate their need to repent? No. Nope. Is Jesus' cross enough? Absolutely. Is his blood able to forgive all of your sins? Absolutely. Is his resurrection from the dead enough power to raise you from your dead life? Absolutely. But do you not need to repent? Yeah. Isn't that the first message? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus. I mean, it says everyone. It doesn't say, yeah, the, the, worst, the worst of you, you know, the Trays and the Emmanuels, the, the ones who are really bad, like the Lukes and stuff like that. You guys need to repent. The rest of you, yeah, just get baptized. It doesn't say that. It says every one of you, the 12-year-old that was in the crowd, the worst thing that they'd ever done was tell their mom that they folded the, the, the lambskins, but they didn't fold the lambskins. He was saying, yeah, you've got to repent too. You've got to repent too. The 80-year-old, that little, little granny that was there, and saying that, I love, I love the Messiah. I've been praying for the Messiah the whole life. He said, yeah, granny, you need to repent too. You've done some bad stuff. Maybe it was 60 years ago and maybe you still did some stuff when you know, your, your, your grandchildren, your parents told you not to give them that Jewish candy. But now you're giving them Jewish candy. That's a sin. <laughs> right? There's, there's old lady sins. There's young lady sins. There's young boy sins. There's old man sins. There's, everyone's got to repent. Yeah. Every one of you. 
in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of those sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 39. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. For all whom the Lord our God will call. Was repentance a New Testament reality? Look at Acts chapter 3, verse 17. Was this after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection? Yeah. Awesome, just want that to be clear. Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Christ would suffer. Repent then. And turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. He says, you may have acted in ignorance, but that doesn't mean you're innocent. Your ignorance doesn't make you innocent. Just because you didn't know that you were doing the wrong thing, doesn't mean it wasn't still the wrong thing and you don't need to repent. Now you know. You've been preached to. You have absolutely full license to repent after today's sermon. Because now you know. Maybe you didn't when you came in today. Whoops. Whoops. Now you know. He says repent and turn to God. Doesn't say all. I think some churches will teach you that is optional. No, as long as I'm having good, if, if I read my Bible, if I go to church on Sundays, I've turned to God. Re- repentance, you know, I'm, I'm, work, I'm repenting. That is not a word in the Bible. There's no such thing as repenting. There's repented and repentance. There's no such thing as repenting. It's not this thing, it's this, this cycle, oh yeah, I'm just, I'm just in my repenting phase. No, what? No, it's, it says repent and turn to God. You've got to do both. See, when you give up your life of sin, crime, whatever you were doing, but don't then turn to God, you're just going to replace it with something else. Yeah. You're going to replace it with something else. I, I, I was the worst of the worst. I was taking cocaine, smoking weed, mushrooms, ketamine, MDMA, I was cheating, catching STDs, getting drunk three times a week, drinking a liter of whiskey. I I got rid of those things. I got rid of pornography. I got rid of masturbation to become a disciple. But I had to fill myself with God. Because if you don't then fill up that empty void, the reason we turn to all these sins is because we've got an emptiness in our soul. You believe, you genuinely think that your family, your degree, your relationships are going to meet your needs. And so when you start to repent, you realize, oh, there's, there's a hole that I was desperately trying to fill. That hole can only be filled with God. And so you've got to change your heart. You've got to turn to God to fill that hole. You won't even feel the need for those things anymore. Yeah. Galatians chapter 5 says, If you walk by the Spirit, you will not even desire to gratify the sinful nature. You won't. If you fill yourself up so much with God, if you turn to God, the desire for pornography is going to go. You won't need it anymore. Because that need is being met by your heavenly father. That desire for drinking so you can feel a little bit relaxed will be gone. The peace that passes understanding comes from Jesus. I I know, I was there, I remember. But praise God, through repentance, through turning to him, I've been clean, sober, no poor, nothing for six years. That's awesome. That's awesome. And yet even now though, if I don't fill my heart with God, other stuff can want to creep in. Pride. Conceit. Jealousy. Wanting to look at, look at my wife and please meet my needs. Please tell me I'm awesome so that... No, the Bible already tells me. On, I can't put a burden on my wife for her to meet my needs like that. On, That's why so many marriages get divorced. Yeah. They're expecting something that their spouse cannot give them. Mm-hmm. That only can come through God. Yeah. And so we've got to turn to the Lord. This was a New Testament reality. Have a look at Acts chapter 5. Repent or perish. Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Peter's on it, man. I like Peter. I bet the title for his sermon was Repent or Perish too. This guy's always preaching. Verse 29. Peter and the other apostles. Okay, now the whole crew's in on it. We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him to his own right hand. As prince and savior, that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. Mm -hmm. Repentance is a gift. It's something that is given. Mm -hmm. 
to you, the ability to repent, to even hear this message, to even hear that this is a theme running throughout the Bible, that is God giving you the gift of repentance, telling you, look, you can be free from your sin. This was after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Yeah. Acts chapter 11. I just want to show you verse 18 this is when the kingdom had been opened for the Gentiles and it says when they heard this they had no further objections that's what I'm hoping to do by showing you all of this through the book of Acts and praise God saying so then God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life and all the Gentiles say Amen. that's all of you if you didn't know yeah. unless anyone's Jewish I don't know that's okay God has granted you repentance unto life. This is a New Testament reality. Acts chapter 17. Let's go. Great. Verse 29. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design and skill. In the past... God overlooked such ignorance. But now, look at this one. He commands all people everywhere to repent. I mean, can it be any clearer? Can it be any clearer? It says he commands. It doesn't suggest, hey, you know, if you feel repentance is awesome. It feels great. But God doesn't say, yeah, do it if you want to feel great. He says, no, don't do it if you want to be saved. He says, I command all people everywhere. Okay, let, let's, let's try it. You guys good at geography? Okay. Who's all people? Oh, you guys are good at geography. Are, are Indians all people? Are Chinese all people? Are English all people? What about the Irish? What about the Romanian? What about the Moldovans? What about the Brazilians? What about the Nigerians? Yes. What about the people from Cork? Yes. Okay. Well, that's, that's different. You got Dublin, you got Cork. You know, Cork think they're the real capital. Yeah. I'll, I'll find out when I go there. We'll see. That's all people. Okay. Who thinks they're not included in that? Okay, awesome. What about everywhere? Is India everywhere? Yeah. Y'all? See? She's good at geography. She can do everything, Anna. She's like on it. What about, what about Nigeria? Is that, is that everywhere? England, Ireland, Cork, Brazil, Moldova, right? All people everywhere are commanded to repent. You know, it's interesting. You go on Google and you type in sermons on repentance. I, I can't find any. Can't find any. How many sermons on repentance have, have you heard? can't find any it seems to me that this is all they preached right. in the book of acts this was the message that changed the entire world and turned the world upside down the message of repentance look at acts chapter 20 verse 21 says, I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. So yeah, but you have repentance, but I have faith. No. Repentance and faith are both required Amen. for salvation. Yeah. If this was the message throughout the book of Acts, the message that turned the world upside down, then why don't people preach repentance now? Why is this message not preached now? If this is, all, if this is exactly what Jesus told them to preach from Mark chapter 6 onwards. Well, look at Mark chapter 6. Maybe we'll find out. Maybe we'll find out why people don't preach this message. Now I might not see some of your faces next week. Come on, bro. Yeah. I know, Jordan. <laughs> I don't know what message I'd have to preach to get rid of Sean, man. Sean, Sean is sold out. Sold out disciple. He'll start preaching back. Sean, Sean will get me. 
Okay. Look at this. After Jesus said, hey, they went out, preached that people should repent. Look at verse 17. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested. And he had him bound and put in prison. Why is Mark talking about this right now? Because Jesus was doing so many miracles that word had gotten back to Herod that John had raised from the dead. And so Herod was like, what? I, I saw his head come off. It says in verse 17, Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested. He had him bound and put in prison. He did this. Why did Herod arrest John? Because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. He told him to repent. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to. So what happens next? She gets her daughter to dance before Herod, persuades him to cut off John's head, and so it happened. Preaching repentance gets you persecuted. You preach repentance, they want to go for your neck. They want to go for your head. We, we think that the reason people don't come to this church, don't want to study the Bible with you anymore, is because you did a bad job. That's what Satan will tell you. Oh, you weren't loving enough. You didn't go do a good job. You, you don't know the scriptures well enough. No, they don't want to repent. John 3, 19 to 21, it tells you this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men loved darkness instead of light because they're evil deeds. They didn't want to come into the light because they didn't want their deeds to be exposed. You guys know the scriptures. You can look it up. John 3, 19 to 21. And so when we preach repentance, people want to get our heads. They want to assassinate your character. And they want to tell anyone else, don't go to that church. They're going to control you. They'll tell you to obey the Bible. <laughs> yeah. Heck yeah. Changed my life. Changed my life. I, I, I am so glad someone told me to repent. Yes. I am so fired up someone told me to repent. I didn't know this life was so much better. I didn't even know it was an option. When I sat down and studied the Bible with them and they said, yeah, you should, you should stop doing that stuff. I was like, really? I didn't even know that was an option. I thought that was just what people did. I said, you, you don't swear every day? Oh, radical. Nice, I'll try. <laughs> you mean you, you don't get drunk three times a week? <laughs> really? Not even once? Okay. That's pretty cool. I mean, I found it so cool. I found it so cool. I was like, are you kidding me? Like, this is an actual option. You guys are like monks, but you're wearing hoodies. Like, what the, what the heck? This is, this is radical stuff. I, I, thought, I, like, I honestly thought, when I came into contact with the kingdom, I'm like, this is too good to be true. What is the deal up with, how? Tell me, you guys look the same, we're wearing the same kind of drip, we're, we're talking the same. How is it that you are like this righteous guy? And that was all, all that I wanted. I grew up in England listening to stories with Arthur and the Round Table, the, the sword and the stone, like these night stories. One of my favorite movies is A Knight's Tale. It's an incredible movie. And, and, and so I always wanted to be noble. I kind of was missing the mark a little bit. On, but then I heard it was an option. Wow. I was like, I'm, I'm going to do that. I want to be noble. I want to be righteous. I'm messing it up quite often, but I'm doing my best to be righteous. It's awesome. It's awesome to actually have an opportunity to repent. That's, that's a message of hope. And yet people don't want to change. Look at John chapter 15. I told you we'd hang out in Mark today, but we're not going to really. Just, just kind of using it as a... wanted to preach repentance and perishing. I saw the purpose for the porpoise. I, I, I couldn't not. I couldn't not. John 15. Look at verse 22. I think, I think this is why people don't want to preach repentance. Because when you do, it does this. Verse 22. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. Now, however, <laughs> they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father as well. They hate us because we're taking away their excuse for their sin. Well, I only do this because my dad abused me. Well, you can't have that excuse anymore. Well, I only do. Well, my dad was an alcoholic. What do you expect? No, it's your personal responsibility. You took away that excuse. Yeah. 
Well, I'm an, I'm an introvert. No, 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 you're selfish, the Bible says. Let me take away that excuse. And so, no, no, my excuses. Give that back. <laughs> Give me my excuses. No, sorry. You're without excuse. You're not, you're not introverted. You're not this. You're not a victim. No, you, you just have sin in your life that you need to repent of. And sorry, I took away the excuse. Ah, I don't like this church. Okay, okay. He who hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them what no one else did, preaching repentance, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they've seen these miracles. No miracles like Anna Chismo. Miracles like Frankie Snow. Miracles like Neche. Miracles like Amy. They've seen the miracles and yet they have hated both me and my father. We get persecuted because we call people to change. I don't know anyone that's ever gotten persecuted for preaching about God's grace. Not that we shouldn't preach about God's grace. I'm about to. But I don't know anyone that's been persecuted for that message. Jesus loves you. How dare you? (laughs) This is a cult. (laughs) Jesus loves me. I've never seen that before. I've never seen that. Hey, you should change. What? That's when the persecution comes. That's when the persecution comes. When we take away excuses. So I know you guys are itching to ask the question, what is biblical repentance? Point number two. What is biblical repentance? Second Corinthians chapter 7. What is biblical repentance? Because, I mean, it's very clear that they were preaching repentance, right? Yes. Okay, only trade. Do I have to go back to Acts chapter 11? Okay, okay, cool. Okay, cool. Nice. All right. Good, 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 good. What is biblical repentance? Second Corinthians 7. Let's have a look. Biblical repentance. Verse 8. Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. That's, that's pretty hard line. Even though I made you sad, I'm not sad about it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I'm happy. Not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. I think, Paul, we get a glimpse of his humanity here. I, I, I always feel a little bit bad when I've had to really call someone to change. Yeah. I, f- I feel bad when I see their face. I'm like, oh man, that was, that was a tough tea time. <laughs> but I'm happy at the end. And I have to go to tell myself, no, Luke, that was the right thing to say. Because yeah. Satan can get in your mind. If you, if you start to, okay, I've got to preach repentance like the apostles. You start telling people to change. They look sad about it. And you go, oh, maybe I did the wrong thing. Maybe I shouldn't have told them to change. Maybe I shouldn't rebuke them. And then it discourages you from preaching the actual message of the Bible later on down the line. I think that it happened to a lot of people. Yeah. I think there was a lot of young, zealous people that loved God, that wanted to be preachers, that started to preach repentance, but then were faced with anger and gnashing of teeth and said, okay, let me call down and let me just be in the Church of England. I think, I think that happened to a lot of people. That's why we go for a more lukewarm version of the Bible, because, nah, I don't want the persecution. Uh, people, people don't ever respond well when I call them to repent, so let me just not call them to repent. No, just don't expect them to respond well. Don't expect them to respond well. I never respond well to being told to repent. But in the end, it leads me to salvation. You became sorrowful as God intended. And so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow, verse 10, brings repentance. That leads to salvation and leaves no regret. So can you have salvation without repentance? No, No, because it says repentance leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. Okay, let's find out what a godly sorrow is. It says, produced. That's the Greek word, kategorizomai, which means to result or accomplish. A godly sorrow should produce something. Repentance in a godly way should produce something in you. It should be fruitful. It says, what earnestness. The word earnestness in the Greek is spude, which means haste. If you recognize your sin, you will be quick. If you see it in a godly way, you will be diligent to get open about that sin. You won't wait for tomorrow. You won't wait for next week. You won't wait for your D time. There's a haste that you have to be open. 
if you have a godly sorrow that leads to repentance. It says, what eagerness to clear yourself. That's the Greek word apologia, which means to accept full responsibility. If you're truly ready to repent, you will take ownership of your sin. And you will not point the finger at anybody else. That's so easy to do. You guys have heard the, the analogy. Every time you point the finger, there's three pointing back at yourself. Right? You've, you've seen that? And that's so true. So true. We've got to have an eagerness to clear ourselves. We've got to, we've got to accept full responsibility. You can change. Taking responsibility gives you the ability to respond. Responsibility gives you the ability to respond. Indignation, it says. Indignation is a characteristic of a godly sorrow. The root word for indignation in the Greek is agkale, which means to ache. You feel that like enough, enough is enough. You know you've been discipled on the same thing every single week in D-time for about a month, and you're like, you're aching at this point? Like, okay, enough is enough. You know, there's, there's a story of a, of a dog sitting on a nail. Wow. A dog sitting on a nail. And, and this man is, is walking, and he's having a good time walking through the forest, and he's like, like, what is that noise? There's a horrible howl, screeching noise. And, he, and he's looking for this, where the sound is coming from, and then he gets up to, to this porch, and there's an old man, I, I can imagine him playing a banjo, sitting on a rocking horse. And his dog is just laying there next to him. It's like, what is your dog doing, bro? And the guy goes, well, he's, he's sitting on a nail. Go, Why isn't he getting up? And the owner says, well, I guess it doesn't hurt bad enough. And that's us. It's only at the point where it aches bad enough. Where it hurts bad enough. That we actually change. You've got to get indignant. You've got to get, okay, I'm done. I'm done with this sin. I'm finished. I'm going to change. It says, what alarm? That's the Greek word phobos. Where we get the word phobia, which means fear. It says we've got to be afraid. Fearing leads to fasting. Think about Paul in Acts chapter 9. He's, he sees Jesus come down, blind his eyes. We spoke about it at Campus Devo the other day. And what does he do? He doesn't eat for three days. It's like, I'm, I'm afraid. God, please have mercy on my soul. Fearing leads to fasting. When you see your sin, you know, I've got to repent of this. I've got to change. It makes you alarmed. Yeah. The word longing in the Greek is epipothesis. That means to, to miss deeply. Have you ever felt like you missed God? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've been there. I've been, when I've, I've been in sin and you finally have that life-giving D time and then you go out to have that quiet time. I remember there was this time I was on an online D time. You think Zoom doesn't work. Man, Zoom can cut you to the heart. So I'm, I'm, I'm sitting with the lion's den. That's the leadership team around Europe. And we're all sitting and I get open hard-heartedly about some sin. I'm like, yeah, I did this, I did this, I did this. And then they start laying into me. You know when you get open... And you think that it's not that bad, but it's really serious. Mm. And other times you get open and you think it's really serious, but it's actually not that bad. That's why it's very important to, to get open, right? And so I get open about this thing that I thought was not that bad. And I get rebuked the trash out of. And I'm sitting in Middlesex University on Zoom. It's like an open day. So there's hundreds of students everywhere. <laughs> like sobbing. So, snot everywhere every, every, it was wild the brothers are sitting behind me in a bible study and i'm just there like weeping at my sin but i went out and i had the most awesome prayer and one of the first things i said was like god i, I missed you because i knew that i didn't feel close to god for a while but i just didn't really know why but then i got rebuked the trash out of and then i finally had that prayer i was like oh god i've missed you that's that's epipathesis that's longing. That moment where you, man. It's been, that you only get that when you really repent. When you have a godly sorrow. When you've made that decision, okay, I'm, I'm changing. God, it's great to see you again. The word concern in the Greek here is zelos, which means zeal. Your excitement starts to come back. Your enthusiasm comes back when you've repented. 
Your zeal, you're like, just fired up. You just see this smile, Casper's smiling at me. He, he knows, he's like, Casper, teens repent on a daily basis. Teens are like, full aways in the morning, evangelists at night. Full aways in the morning, evangelists at night. It's so all over the place. And this is, Casper is always me smiling at me. That that excitement comes back, you're just like, I'm so fired up. I'm so fired up. Ugh. You know, that's, that's, that's Casper. It's awesome to get that zeal back. And then readiness to see justice done. The word in Greek is ektakesis. Which means to be ready to face the consequences. Wow. At this point of your repentance, you're just ready to see justice done. If you know you've done a, a, a serious crime, yeah. at that point, you're like, you know what? Yeah. I'd go to jail. As long, just let me get baptized first. Let me be right with the Lord, and then I'll go. I, I don't care. Yeah. I'll go preach in jail. I'll go preach to the people in jail. I don't care. I'm, I, I just want to get saved. That's that heart. That's, I'm willing to come clean. I'm willing to face the consequences. That's if, if you've been in purity. I'm so inspired by some of the dating relationships. There's been, there's been some, some, some dating relationships in the kingdom that hasn't gone too well. And the brother was secretly hiding in purity. And he got open to, to the lady that he was engaged to. He said, I'm, I'm so sorry. I've been, I've been secretly in impurity. But I'm, I'm willing to accept the consequences. And so she handed back the ring. And they've been able to maintain their friendship. They're not going to get married anymore. But he was ready to face the consequences. He's like, my relationship with God is more important than faking this marriage. Than faking this marriage. And so I accept the consequences. If, if we need to break up, break up for the glory of God, then so be it. That's, that's awesome. That's godly repentance. That's when you're ready to see justice done. I think a prime example. Look at Matthew chapter 26 here. Let's see an example of, of godly sorrow versus worldly sorrow. Godly sorrow versus worldly sorrow. I won't give you the context. You know the story. A girl is asking Peter if, if she had been with Jesus. And it says in verse 74. He began to call down curses on himself. And he swore to them, I don't know the man Jesus. Immediately a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Peter was brought to the point of sorrow. In this moment, seeing what his sin had done to Jesus. Let's keep reading. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people came to the decision to put Jesus to death. They bound him led him away and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 silver coins to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us? They replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. This is... A contrast between a godly sorrow and a worldly sorrow. Yeah. We look to 2 Corinthians 7. It says godly sorrow leads to repentance, which leads to salvation. Whereas a worldly sorrow brings death. Yeah. Both these men felt remorse yeah. at what they had done to Jesus. But one took that remorse and decided to feel guilty that he was caught. Mm. And so hung himself. We can do that spiritually. We can hang ourselves spiritually out of guilt and a refusal to accept the grace of God. Wow. How did Peter and the church in Corinth get to the point of godly sorrow, but Judas didn't? How did, how did Peter go from this moment to becoming the leader of the first century church? How did the Corinth church go from having terrible things happening in their church to the point where they had a godly sorrow? Wow. Well, number one... Judas got open to the wrong people. Yeah. He got open to the religious that had no care for his soul. Yeah. And so he received poor slash no discipling. Mm. They said, what's that to us? That's your responsibility. That's, that's your sin, bro. Yeah. I don't want to help you. Wow. Whereas the Corinthians and Peter, they got some serious discipling. Yeah. Paul said, because I wrote you this letter, because I made you sad, because I made you feel that sorrow through that discipling, through that rebuke. 
it led you to a godly sorrow. So when did Peter get that godly sorrow? Look at John chapter 21. At what point did, G, did Peter get a godly sorrow? Now this is what I think. I could be wrong. I don't know the Holy Bible. And I don't know everyone's heart. Only God does. But this is, this is what I think was the point that Peter got that godly sorrow. Good John chapter 21. It says in verse 1. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out of fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, yeah, we'll go with you too. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. They were right back where they started. Right back to Luke chapter 5 where he spent all night fishing and got nothing. When Jesus told them to go fishing for men, Peter said, I'm going out to fish. And him being the leader took everyone else with him too. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. And that's so often when we don't have that godly sorrow, we are unable to really see Jesus. But look at verse 15. Please study the rest of the chapter out in your quiet time. But for the sake of time, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord. He said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, he's using his old name. Do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, so take care of my sheep. The third time he said to me, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? I think Jesus was reminding of the three times he had rejected him. I think this was a great D time for Peter. Jesus was showing him his sin. And it says that through Jesus asking these three questions, through Jesus telling him, you rejected me three times, Peter. You rejected me three times. It says that Peter was hurt. The word hurt in the Greek is lipeo. It's the same word used in 2 Corinthians 7, which says, I know that my letter hurt you. Once Paul was able to hurt the Corinthian church in a godly way, they changed. When Jesus was able to hurt Peter in a godly way, he changed. And Jesus finishes by saying, follow me. Discipling is to guide us to a godly sorrow. That's why we need corrections, rebuke. It's to get us to that place where we're ready to change. We need it. We need to change. Because if we don't repent, we perish. Point number three. You can't spell grace without race. The question is, are you running yours? You can't spell grace without race. Are you running yours? Look at Acts chapter 20. Almost there. Do I still have the church? Verse 24. I love this scripture. It says, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. Can you say that today? Can you consider your bank account worth nothing to you? Your clothing. Your families, whatever is in the way of you becoming a disciple or being a disciple, can you consider it nothing to you? It says, the only thing I want to do is that I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Paul's specific commission in the New Testament was to preach the gospel of God's grace. That's why he's nicknamed the Apostle of Grace. He is nicknamed the Apostle of Grace. Paul speaks about grace in his epistles 144 times. That's twice as much as the rest of the whole Bible put together. In in Paul's epistles, he preaches more about grace, twice as much grace than the whole of the rest of the Bible. He's the Apostle of Grace. 
But even being the apostle of grace, he never saw grace as negating the need for repentance and deeds. He is the apostle of grace and preaches all day long about grace, but you can't spell grace without race. You can't be receiving the grace of God if you're not in the race for your soul. Look at Acts chapter 26. Grace does not negate the need for repentance. Look at, this is the apostle of grace. Verse 20. First to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and in all Judea, to the Gentiles also, I preached that they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. That was what the apostle of grace preached. That yes, you receive the grace of God, but the grace of God should produce repentance proven by deeds. 1 Corinthians 15, this is going to be our last scripture here. First Corinthians 15. Trey already shared one about running the race, so I'm not going to bother with that one. But look at this. Verse 1. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel. I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you, which you have received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. The word, kate- the word hold is the Greek word katako, which is the same word used for the good soil that we looked at the other day. That's, that's holding on. It's being that good soil, your life producing 30, 60, or 100 times what was sown. It says, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures, that He appeared to Peter and then to the Twelve. After that, He appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then He appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. It says grace should motivate you to run your race. He said, has the grace of God been without effect in your life? Has the grace of God been without effect in your life? There are churches that preach about grace every single week, and so they should. It's an important message, but it leads to no repentance. And so we're missing a vital piece of the gospel, which is grace leads to repentance. Has the grace of God been without effect in your life? Has the grace of the disciples, the grace of God through your brothers and sisters been without effect in your life where do you need to repent where do you personally need to repent reflect i had to reflect on this myself it's like luke so what's what's this what's this message for you where do you need to repent and what are you going to do about it discipling gets you to a godly sorrow get open about that area where you specifically need to change and get the help that you need get the guidance get the inspiration there's an awesome irish band called U2. You may have heard of them. The lead singer is a guy called Bono. They wrote a song about grace. The song says, Grace, she takes the blame. She covers the shame, removes the stain. Grace, it's the name for a girl, but it's also a thought that changed the world. Grace, she carries a pearl in perfect condition. That's the kingdom of God. What once was hurt, what once was friction, what left a mark no longer stings because grace makes beauty out of ugly things. 
We were all ugly things. But for a disciple that was motivated by grace, decided to come into our lives and share their faith with us. I want you to make it your goal that by the EMC in Barcelona, you decide to be motivated by the grace of God and either become a disciple and get baptized or go out and get someone baptized. Amen. Motivated by the grace of God. I love you. And to God be all the glory.